Hey everyone, this is part four of I'm a monster created by the government to hunt other monsters. If you want to listen to the first three parts, they'll be linked in the top of the description. Enjoy everyone. Dr. John and I had come across an abandoned cabin 10 miles deep into the forest. It was evident to both of us that we would be staying there for the time being. It was also more than likely that us killing the avian creature had attracted the attention of other cryptids, and they would soon be there to clean up what was left. Dusk was approaching and the shadows of the trees were growing stronger. We needed to be efficient. I've stated in the past that I wasn't keen on the idea of bringing others with me, but John was intelligent and much more of an asset than a liability. I slowly approached these steps of the front deck to the cabin, crawling across the ground on all fours. And Dr. John was close behind, putting in an effort to be as quiet as possible. The cabin itself was in decent but not pristine shape. There was rotting spots in the wood, and the steps to the deck were dented. The front left window had a crack running up the middle. Vegetation was beginning to grow its way up the sides of the foundation. I sniffed the air, seeing if I could pick up the scent of any sort of entity within the structure, but was relieved when I came up with nothing. It seemed safe for the moment. I smell nothing, doctor. It should be safe, but still be cautious of your surroundings. John nodded, clearly on board with my assessment. Well, you're the expert, he hopped lightly, before following my lead up to the deck. I sliced the remaining integrity of the lock off with my claws and pushed the door open, letting us both inside. I stood up in a bipedal fashion once in the foyer, the ceiling being about nine feet high, only giving me a foot of headroom. In case there was anything inside that was masking its scent, John and I did a sweep of the interior, wanting to be thorough about whether or not we were alone. We found nothing but spiderwebs and dust, along with an assortment of old silverware in the kitchen, confirming that we were the only ones in the cabin. And pretty soon, we're going to have to think about food, John announced, bringing in a stack of kindling for the old, cracked and worn down stone fireplace in the foyer. Indeed, I replied. In fact, I can journey out now even and see if I can kill something and bring it back while you build the fire. A distribution of labor. John looked up as he began to arrange and stack the kindling into the fireplace, seemingly pleased by my proposal. Well, hurry up. It's nearly dark. Not that I'm too worried about you. I just... He trailed off. What is it, doctor? I inquired, shifting my gaze towards him. I just don't want to be alone when it gets dark, even if we're inside. I don't want to sound like I'm a coward. I just... I raised a fingernail into the air, cutting off his sentence. I understand, and you don't have to explain yourself, Doctor. I'll attempt to be back as soon as possible. Stay quiet and keep low. You don't want to draw the attention of whatever might be lurking within these trees. Then with that, I opened the door, got back down on all fours, and crawled out into the forest. My night vision started to kick in as it got darker. I went west of the cabin continuously sniffing the air to see if I could pick up any foreign scents, mainly of something like a deer. I know that John and I wouldn't be able to stay here for long, one because the agency would come for us, and it wouldn't be long before they found us, and two, the other cryptids would realize our presence and attempt to kill or take John, seeing as he's a human, and three, because I made a promise to a Wendigo back at the facility and I would return within a reasonable time period to come free him, provided that he holds up his end of the agreement and only feeds on animals and other monsters, not human flesh. I wasn't familiar with this forest, so navigating and keeping track of where I was going proved to be difficult. I made sure to make a mental note of where the cabin was in the event that I needed to return quickly. 
As I pushed through bushes and maneuvered through the trees, I finally began to pick up on a scent. A strong, horrendously powerful but familiar scent. Blood. I followed the smell, only becoming more potent the closer I got to the source. It was fresh, and I'm sure I wouldn't be the only thing making my way towards it. There was a large clearing in the trees up ahead, and I could make out a bulky figure standing in or kneeling over something else, presumably its kill. I latched onto one of the trees on the edge of the clearing, and climbed upwards to get a better view, as well as keeping the element of surprise. I glanced toward the ground and a new scent had combined itself with the blood. It was a charred flesh, as if multiple layers of skin had been burnt to a crisp. I recoiled, seeing as how it was suddenly and simultaneously explosively it had emerged into my nostrils. On the ground, I was met with the sight of what looked to be a bipedal creature knelt down over a pack of five dead wolves, all of them torn to shreds, either missing a head, half their body, a leg, or ears, two of which suffered at losing all four. The creature wasn't very tall, maybe five and a half feet at most, but it was extremely muscular, dark blue veins running along its arms. Its skin was patchy, some of it being burnt to a crispy black, while others were a more elegant light brown. It possessed short patches of dark green hair on the areas where it lacked burns. On the top of its head sat not two, but three curved horns, white like bones and sharp at the tip like blades. The creature noticed my presence, turning around as it let out a deep snarl. Its face consisted of a triangular-shaped mouth filled with razor-sharp but blood-stained teeth, above which were a row of five blue glowing eyes, all fixated on me as I stayed perched up in the tree. In its left hand, it clutched the severed head of one of the wolves, blood still oozing its way out below the snout. This entity didn't appear to have any claws or fingernails, just a six long, meaty, and horrifically charred fingers on each hand. Mine, mine, mine. It repeated in a raspy voice, with an echo so powerful it could be heard for potentially miles on end. It dropped the wolf head and bared its teeth at me, performing its idea of challenging me to combat. Even though I hadn't come out here searching for a battle, it had already seen me. I didn't know the full extent of its sense and abilities, but I couldn't risk it following me back to the cabin, where John was vulnerable. So, I did the only thing that seemed logical at the time. I scurried down from the tree and stood as tall as possible, opening my hands and letting my claws be put on full display, as I had done many times before. The cryptid immediately charged, not wasting any time speaking or continuing its attempts to intimidate me. I was prepared. I started out by sidestepping the creature, as he began to frantically swing his fist while his rampage in my direction. A punch of his connected with the trunk of a tree just behind me, hollowing out a large portion of the wood, and sending splinters flying through the air as a result of the heavy impact. I wrapped a hand around one of the creature's horns and proceeded to lift him and swing his body in a circle for a brief second before slamming him into the already damaged trunk. His mass colliding with the tree caused it to fall over and hit the ground, creating an obnoxiously loud boom throughout the forest. The entity had caught me off guard with a swing from its right fist after recovering from the days of the attack, launching me back nearly a dozen feet towards the clearing, right into the decimated wolf corpses. The force of the blow was unlike any other I had received before, but it was going to take much more than that to make me yield. I got up as the creature charged yet again, raising both its fists and preparing to slam them down on my torso. When it was within range, I simply leaped forward this time, my slim figure allowing me to pass through the gap of its two forearms as they were in the air and land behind it. I wasted no time by following it up with a counterattack. 
I lunged towards its back and sank my claws as deep as I could into its flesh, causing it to squeal and shriek as an almost rainbow-patterned stream of blood leaped out onto my arms. Its screams of pain were in shocking contrast to that of its growl and snarls of aggression and malice. In retaliation, the creature delivered a swift but explosive elbow to my chest, sending me onto the ground and sliding across the dirt. My hideous opponent was beyond furious, but also desperate. Blood was seeping from the wounds that I had inflicted on his back. I lifted myself off the ground and pounded on the weeping creature, extending out an arm near his face and dragging my claws across his eyes, completely blinding him. He thrashed around violently as he reached over in order to grab me. I kept maneuvering and moving around to keep myself out of his grasp as his howls of pain continued to flood my ears. I kept myself latched onto the creature's back as I continued to slash and tear at his tissue. He was able to throw me off his back, but not before I grabbed one of the horns on top of his head and tore it out of its spot. And the screams before were nothing in comparison to what he bellowed after that. I gripped the horn in my right hand, lunged at him one last time, and came down on him, letting out a snarl of my own as I jammed the horn into the top of his skull and dug it deep enough to hit his brain. The entity's movement ceased. It let out a lengthy but faint breath as its last seconds of life faded away, soon collapsing onto the ground and its body going limp. He was dead now, that much was apparent, and since I was hungry, I decided to indulge myself in his corpse, ripping and tearing as much meat off his bone as I could until I was satisfied. Loads of his oddly colored blood had dripped down my chin and onto my chest. I wiped it away after finishing my feast and stood up. Soon, animals and other cryptids would converge on the site of our chaotic and brutal showdown, presumably to clean up what was left over. I noticed a bit of my own dark blue colored blood drip to the ground from a small puncture wound on my waist. My chest also ached from the first hit I had taken from the creature towards the start of the fight, but I knew that it would heal soon enough and I would be fine. I left the clearing after looking around for a bit and killed a simple squirrel on the way back to the cabin for John to eat. I didn't have time to look for anything bigger or more filling, not with John still at the cabin by himself with no weapons left for self-defense. What took you so long? He exclaimed as I let myself in, being careful not to stand up too fast and hit my head in the ceiling. I was unfortunate enough to encounter a cryptid. I replied, I couldn't risk it following me back here and uh, discovering you. John's expression of annoyance quickly shifted into one of gratitude, but also pride. He seemed quite impressed at what I considered a casual announcement. Oh, well, thank you. That's probably the right call. I mean, after all, you're the boogeyman's boogeyman. Without responding verbally, I held out a corpse of the squirrel that I had snatched up on the way back. John looked at it blankly, unimpressed by what was in front of him. That's my dinner, I'm guessing, he asked, already aware of the answer. Precisely, I responded, raising my opposite hand and pointing a finger toward the fireplace, which was now lit, the smell of smoke lingering in the foyer as the flames danced around the wood. Well, I found some knives in the kitchen after I finished up making the fire. I'll get one and gut this poor guy, John announced, holding up the squirrel above his head. John went on and did as he had proposed, skinning and gutting the dead creature, although he didn't appear to be very skilled at it. There wasn't enough time for him to perfect his craft, as we had to keep moving in the morning. I sat with John by the fire as he allowed his meal to cook. An experience I never had previously. It was soothing. The only time I ever had to relax was in my containment cell back at the facility. I was put in there between operations or missions. Granted, they had allowed me to roam around inside. But there wasn't much to entertain or stimulate me. I accepted it back then. Saw it as a positive and didn't question the nature of why I was in there. 
But now I know, uh, the more and more I reflect, the more I realize how cruel they truly were to me. Uh, despite them spending decades manipulating me into thinking the contrary. But instead of focusing on my own suffering, I turned my attention to John, who stared unventfully into the fire as his meat was being cooked. Um, doctor, before we had escaped, when I intervened in your fight with the other scientist, he mentioned your daughter had been taken by a cryptid. I stated, Is that true? John's eyes widened, taken aback by what I had just brought up. But he kept his composure, even though I could see a look of despair emerging onto his face. The kind of despair only a grieving father could hold. Yes, he replied softly. It's why I joined the agency, to study and learn more about the supernatural. The things that were here before us and will be here after. I thought that maybe if I learned enough, that I could find her. Maybe save her. But it's pretty stupid to think that she's still alive. Don't feel bad. It's just reality. Us. I quizzed, confused by his wording. Yes, us. He repeated. Listen, Bron. I don't consider you a monster. Not at all. And I'm truly sorry for what the agency did to you for so long. All their lies and deceit. I should have done something sooner. I was just being a coward. I immediately put a hand on John's back, being careful not to pierce his skin with my claws. You're no coward, doctor. You defended and stood your ground for me even when it was in your place to do so. You assisted me in conquering a threat that was far beyond your understanding and range of knowledge, even when you could have died. The only coward I've ever met is Dr. West. A smirk crept up on John's face, drastically changing the energy of his mood. He kept turning the meat over the fire as he replied. Yeah, but thanks to you, she's six feet under. He huffed as his eyes stared forward. John retracted the meat from the flames. With it now fully cooked, he brought it towards the center of the floor that we sat on. Placing it on an old cloth he had presumably discovered while looking around the cabin. Of all the people that I've met, you're the most human out of all of them, John vocalized, taking a glance up towards my eyes. I'm grateful for your kindness, doctor, but this world, your species, they will never accept me. No matter how much I try to prove otherwise, I will always be a monster in their eyes, and nothing more. But that won't stop me from protecting your kind. That's extremely noble of you, Bron. Protecting a group that doesn't deserve it. I know we're definitely not saints, but I guess we're salvageable. He said with a hint of sarcasm near the end. The rest of the night went as expected. John and I discussed our views in the world and the predicament that we were currently in. He even taught me certain social customs and things humans do that I didn't know of. Like fist bumping, which was odd seeing as he had just informed me of the gesture of high-fiving not long ago. John finished his dinner and we soon drifted off to sleep. Although, he ended up sleeping far longer than I did. I only need a couple of hours at most due to the way that I was designed. John awoke as the sun had just finished rising. Birds were outside chirping away as the morning light shined through the windows. We didn't waste any time. He and I exited the cabin and began journeying deeper into the forest. John, bringing along the knife that he had used to prepare his meal the previous night, as a last resort weapon. You know, when my daughter was taken and I realized I would never get her back, I considered ending it all. Just a few too many pills and the pain would all be over. I thought there was no point to living if I didn't have her around. John announced it with an almost apathetic tone, as if he had just informed me that he stepped on a twig. The pain in his eyes was vivid. I could tell that he was masking what he truly felt. I was sure he was used to it due to his line of work, always concealing his grief for the sake of the mission and in the name of progress. I stopped us both, looking down at John as he tried to avoid eye contact. 
I'm truly sorry. If I were there to save her, I would have done it in a heartbeat, I stated. I know nothing about such experience, but I can guarantee you were a great father. We approached close to the clearing where I had fought and killed the strange entity last night. All the leftover biomass and body parts were gone. It was easy to assume wildlife and other cryptids had come to clean up overnight, only leaving patches of blood spread out across the grass. Jesus, you weren't kidding when you said you messed them up pretty good. John stated, pointing at the site of the aftermath. He seemed quite upset. I inter Before I could finish my sentence, a repetitive whooshing and whipping caused me to turn my head toward the sky. John was slightly confused at first, wondering what it was that I was reacting to. But in several seconds, it came within his range of hearing. Crap, helicopter. He exclaimed in a forceful whisper. Get low, now, I shot back. John and I both lowered ourselves to the ground as fast as possible, crawling behind some bushes in an attempt to keep ourselves more effectively hidden. They know we're in this forest. We gotta get out of here soon, before they cut off all their exits, John went on. I told you it would have been wise to destroy the truck. They surely tracked it here. It was foolish to leave it be, and now we're in jeopardy. The helicopter hovered over the clearing. For several seconds before descending, eight soldiers with gear that I had recognized emerged from the vehicle, four from each side. They curiously circled the clearing after exiting, investigating and looking over the blood as John and I watched from behind the bushes and trees. The helicopter itself was mounted with what looked to be machine guns and small capacity missile launchers of its own clearly doubling as a transport and combat vehicle. There were soldiers from the agency. Speaking of which, one grabbed his radio, pushing down the button and speaking into it as he looked over the area. Come in, command. This is Agent Ben reporting in with Team X-1. We're at the site now, with evidence of some sort of feeding frenzy that took place. There are currently no concrete signs of Subject 16A or Dr. Jonathan R. Dilliard but we'll keep looking. Actually, one of the other agents called out. You might want to take a look at this. He punctuated by pointing towards the ground. When I had realized what it was that he was talking about, I could physically feel the blood stop itself mid-flow in my veins. The soldier was pointing at a particular patch of blood. My blood. The blood of mine that had seeped out from my minuscule wound after the confrontation with the cryptid, but it was enough to be seen. It might be his, the agent followed up, kneeling down to get a better look. Let's get a sample and get it back to the lab. We'll let the geeks run their test and do their thing, the other replied. John crawled over closer to me, looking into my eyes with grand intentions. It appeared by just his facial expression alone that he had hatched a plan. Use your claws to tear some of my lab coat, he asked, yanking at the fabric. His idea had quickly clicked in my mind. I did as requested and quietly ripped some of the material off his coat with two of my fingernails. John scratched his own cheeks and forehead hard enough to just about draw blood, and then scrapped his hands against the ground rubbing mud on the clothes and skin to make it appear as if he had just escaped an attack. Climb up one of these trees and get the vantage point. I'm going to bluff long enough to get them all in a close enough spot, where you can take them out without any disaster, he informed me. Be careful, doctor, I nodded to him, following his request and using stealth and precision to scale the tree closest to me. John sighed clearly nervous about what was soon to be going down. He raised himself up and began to march toward the clearing, making sure to walk with a limp for a more convincing effect. The soldiers quickly turned their attention and pointed their assault rifles at John. Come in, command. Come in, command. Dr. Jonathan R. Dilliard had just been spotted, requesting orders. The biggest of the bunch said after fidgeting with his radio. John held his hands high in the air. I could only see at the back of him for now, 
but I could smell the fear coming off of him. He was terrified, yet still doing what needed to be done. Don't shoot, John pleaded. You don't understand. Subject 16A, he, he forced me. He said he would kill me just like he did West if I didn't help him get out. He made me drive him and dump him out here. I only just barely got away. It was unclear whether or not the men had bought his story. They still kept their rifles trained on him, not letting their guard down. We have orders to kill 16A once we find him. One of the agents in the back shouted, Where was he last at before you got away? There's a cabin about a half mile from the clearing. I can take you to it, but we gotta be careful. 16A isn't the only thing in these woods. He punctuated by pointing at all the blood on the ground. The agents all turned and looked at each other, debating whether or not it was a smart move to follow John. I was thoroughly impressed with his ability to keep calm in the face of such overwhelming odds. We'll go with you, doctor, said the agent in the front, but you gotta stay in our sight. You try to cut and run or pull a fast one, and I'll personally make sure you end up as Swiss cheese. Or better yet, I might even let 16A have his way with you before we take him out too. The man then turned and nodded his head to the pilot in the helicopter, signaling for him to stay behind. John motioned to the group and began to lead them out of the clearing towards the cabin. I stayed behind and didn't immediately follow. I wanted to wait a bit. The agents knew I often liked to move from tree to tree, so if I were too close and they had decided to look up, it would surely mean the death of John and potentially me as well. It's a shame what happened to West, said the leading soldier. Really, I kind of thought she was a nutcase, replied one of the agents towards the rear of the line. All the others seemed to agree with the latter, a few of them even nodding their heads to further the point. I maintained my silent movements as I followed the men from up in the trees, sizing them all up as we approached closer to the cabin. Yes, but please be careful, he might still be inside, John said, feigning concern. The agents still raised their weapons and slowly surrounded the perimeter of the cabin. Two went right up to the front door, presumably to breach it. And they looked at each other for a few moments before one had clutched his rifle, leaned back and kicked the door down, despite the fact that I had already sliced the lock off. The pair entered inside to search the interior, while the other six kept themselves posted around the perimeter keeping them in close enough range to take them out, but also not to get overwhelmed. It started with the back of the cabin, swiftly but quietly jumping down from the tree and right behind the guards. And before they could react, I quickly grabbed them each by the skull and slammed their heads together, using just enough force to knock them both unconscious for the time being. And just to be on the safe side, I also grabbed and squeezed the radio devices, crushing them in my hands and cutting off their communications. I was also careful enough not to leave them sprawled out too close to the windows where they could be seen, not wanting the agents inside to sound the alarm if they caught a glimpse of their unconscious comrades. I moved fast, scaling my way up the back wall of the cabin and onto the roof. Hey, did you hear something? One of the guards posted on the right side asked. Nick, would you relax? You always get paranoid when we're doing operations, replied the one next to him. While on the roof, I shifted over towards the right side of the structure, silently leaning over and peering down below at the agents as they watched the tree line. I repeated the same set of actions I had done with the first pair, and then crawled back up to the roof, maneuvered to the left side and did it once again, only leaving the pair that was searching the inside of the cabin still left. Still moving around the roof on all fours, I made my way over to the front and signaled to John to lure out the two remaining agents. Hey, quick, get out here, now, he shouted. There's something coming. The two agents rushed outside, pointing their rifles all around in a frantic attempt to find out what it was John was talking about. What is it, Doc? exclaimed the leader towards John. I dropped down and pounced on the two guards slamming once against the wood and letting him slump to the floor of the deck. The other one was able to fire a shot off before I grabbed him, 
The bullet struck me in the waist and a small puddle of my blood had splashed onto the dusty wood finish below us. Instead of immediately knocking him out, I went for his gun first, yanking it from his grasp and slamming it hard enough on the railing of the deck to snap it in half. He attempted to hit the button on his radio and alert command what was happening, but I was quicker and I used my claw to slash off his index finger and thumb before they could make contact. He fell to his knees, clutching these stumps as blood pulled around his hand. I grabbed his neck and began wrapping my fingers around his throat and lifting him into the air as I stood up. Let me go, you ugly son of a gun, he squirmed, making futile efforts to escape my hold. I bared my teeth. The stinging from the gunshot wound had begun to bother me, but it wasn't nearly as bad as I thought it would be. It would heal soon enough. The agents utilized armor-piercing rounds on missions, which is what I assumed had hit me. At least now, I had the answer to whether or not I was bulletproof. Dr. John marched over and with a smug look on his face as a healthy, still struggling agent. Just would like to get the record straight and say that I came up with this plan, but I couldn't have done it without my good old buddy Braun here, he taunted. You're both a couple of worthless traitors, the agent shot back. Nothing but two cowards who can't face their responsibility. Don't even know why we're wasting resources trying to get you back or kill you. But when it does happen, I'll be more than happy to watch both be executed, you freaks. That word came up again. Freak. God, I hated it. I used to play it off and ignore the instances where someone called me that word, but I was done tolerating it. All those years I let it slide, but no more. I turned and slung the agent hard enough to send him crashing through one of the front windows and colliding with the fireplace in the foyer. When he impacted with the stone, dust dispersed itself vertically and horizontally from behind his back before he fell face first onto the floor. The spot where he had impacted had left a dent, a dent that was dripping with an uneven coating of blood. Even John was shot. He stepped past all the broken glass from the window and slowly approached the agent's body, rolling up his sleeve and checking for a pulse. He's dead, John confirmed. Gosh, Braun, you threw him hard enough to kill him. Not that I blame you. And to be completely truthful, I hadn't meant to actually kill the man. The combination of the irritation from the gunshot wound and his continuous arrogance had flared up my rage, causing me to use more force than what I had originally intended to do. Even covered in body armor and gear, he still couldn't handle the force of the impact. The second human being I had ever killed. But unlike with Dr. West, this death didn't feel satisfying or cathartic. Rather, it caused me to feel quite guilty even despite the anger that I had felt towards him. Hey, don't feel bad, Braun. He was far from a good man, John said, almost sensing the change in my demeanor. It's not like you just slaughtered the whole squad like some bloodthirsty monster. I knew he didn't have time for me to stand there and reflect on what had taken place. I ordered John to grab one of the unconscious soldier's rifles, along with the two radios that I hadn't yet destroyed and follow me back to the helicopter. The pilot was still sitting inside the cockpit. The look on his face was one of complete and utter terror as he spotted John and I emerging from the trees and into the clearing. He attempted to try and radio command for help, but with my speed and disregarding my wound, I ran across the clearing on all fours and leapt into the helicopter, grabbing the pilot's arm and stopping him. You will not say a word to them. But if they so choose to contact you, you will inform them everything is going according to plan. Otherwise, I'll put an end to you and pick your bones clean. I growled, burying my teeth just inches from the pilot's face. He took my threat seriously, and that itself was a massive understatement, considering I picked up the scent of urine suddenly coming from his crotch area. John boarded the helicopter after finishing his dash across the clearing, panting heavily as he clutched the rifle that he had picked up. Take us back to Site 12. If you try anything funny, I'll paint the windows with your brain matter. John ordered the pilot, keeping the rifle aimed at his head. The pilot, sweating and slightly shaking in horror, 
maneuvered the helicopter out of the clearing and ascended the three of us into the sky. The helicopter radio crackled to life soon afterward. This is command. Please confirm mission status. I repeat, this is command. Please confirm mission status. The pilot's eyes frantically darted around. John pressed the barrel harder against his temple. I drew my claws, waving them slightly near the pilot in order to intimidate him. This is Chopper Y-32. Mission was a failure. Dr. Jonathan R. Dilliard and Subject 16A have yet to be discovered and or eliminated. Heading back to base. Although it wasn't what we told him to say, it still worked in our favor nonetheless. The ride itself wasn't very long due to the method of transportation. It went by far faster than when we had traveled here in the truck. John kept his rifle up against the pilot's head the entire time. I was uncomfortable during most of the ride due to having to lean over while inside the cockpit because of my height. Are, are you guys going to kill me? The pilot asked, making sure that his radio was muted. Not if you do what we ask, John replied. What do you guys even want? Money? Guns? We want salvation for both man and cryptid, I snarled, and for the agency to pay for its crimes. Once the facility came into view, John and I ordered the pilot to fly to the south end of the building, but still kept us hovering well above the ground. I couldn't simply go inside and free the Wendigo, not how I did it last time. We got lucky and John was able to talk his way through security and get the cameras disabled while I convinced the Wendigo of our plan. Not to mention it was now daytime, which meant more guards roaming the hallways. We needed a distraction, and I knew just what it would be. A missile from the helicopter, right at the north end of the building where the weapons vault was located. Not only would it be detrimental to their ability to defend themselves, but it would draw them away from the Wendigo cages, long enough for me to free the one that I made the deal with. We see that you're within range to land at Chopper Y-32. Just wanted to confirm your coordinates. Came a voice from the radio. The interior security cameras wouldn't come into play this time around. Not only would they be unlikely to be monitored in real time during all the commotion, but there's a good chance the explosion would corrupt and destroy their ability to function properly. Fire rocket, John demanded the pilot. Northeastern corner. Oh, what? The pilot shrieked. Are you insane? No, I growled, reinforcing John's command. Sweat dripped itself down from the pilot's forehead as he reached a shaky finger over to the launch button on the cockpit control panel. I could feel the vibrations of the helicopter as the rocket tore through the air and hit its designated target. The explosion was deafening, sending massive shockwaves through the air as flames engulfed the surrounding area before it quickly dissipating. I told the pilot to hover the helicopter over the roof of the building. The sounds of rapid footsteps yelling and voices filled my ears. The alarms were going off, confirming the explosion had damaged the system. Once I retrieve the one to go, I will return to you, doctor, and get out of here. Fly deep into the forest and wait for our arrival, I said in a rushed tone. John tightened his grip on the rifle, hesitant to do as I proposed. But what about you? Go, I shouted, before they shoot this helicopter down. I jumped out of the side and onto the roof. John stared at the pilot as he quickly turned the helicopter around and began flying into the forest behind the building doing it just in time before they were shot down. The cryptid containment cells were on the south end of the building, the complete opposite side of where we caused all the commotion. Agents were flooding outside with what little amount of weapons they had left, trying to find any other threats in the area. My gunshot wound had nearly healed completely, so it didn't give me much trouble as I crawled along the roof to the south end of the facility. I found an exterior air duct vent, I quickly wrapped my claws around the cover and tore it off before crawling inside. While scurrying around, I made a trip to the boiler room and I had encountered while hiding in the walls earlier on. I grabbed the most girthy and solid steel beam that I could find and I took it with me. After which, I journeyed over to the cryptid containment cells, specifically the Wendigo cages. I dropped down from the ceiling after exiting the air dock and there he was, 
standing docile behind the strong glass and just staring off into space. Although he perked up when he saw me. For once, I saw some spark of life in those sunken, deer skull eyes. I wasted no time. I began to hit the reinforced glass as hard as I could with the beam. Swing after swing, impact after impact, and it finally cracked. It actually worked. I pulled the beam back in with all my might and swung it one last time, finally breaking the glass. The Wendigo was joyful as he slowly stepped out into freedom, but that was easy to tell from looks alone. You were honest, he said, in what I assumed to be his default voice without mimicking anyone or anything. It was low, yet not extremely bassy tone, resembling the loud whisper of an average man. Follow me, I advised. Be prepared, we may have to fight, but you must remember our bargain. No killing the humans unless absolutely necessary. Saying it almost made me feel hypercritical, considering early events. I led the Wendigo down the hall, and we both got down and did our best to move quickly towards one of the side exits on the facility. I was quite a bit faster, but slowed down enough for us to be within a reasonable distance of each other. You kept your word, he told me as we dashed down the hall. As I said I would, I replied while keeping my eyes laid upon the sight in front of us. I picked up the scent of a guard around the corner. We'd surely have to take him out before moving on. As to why he hadn't joined his comrades at the explosion site was questionable. When we rounded the corner, the guard was paralyzed in pure terror as he got a look at the Wendigo and me. I pounced across the room and grabbed him before he could react, slamming his head against the wall on the right and letting him fall unconscious. I laid eyes on one of the doors with emergency exit labeled above it. I didn't stop running and neither did the Wendigo as he trailed close behind. I threw my weight at the door, causing it to be yanked right off of its hinges and slam onto the ground. Into the forest, I announced, beginning to dash into the tree line as the Wendigo followed. I could only hope this would be the last time I'd ever have to set foot inside at that cursed building. After I had picked up John Scent, it wasn't long before we were reunited. He was still taken aback by the sight of another entity with me. He originally had disagreed with my plan to free the creature. I motioned for the Wendigo to follow me into the helicopter with John and the pilot. Speaking of which, the pilot seemed to be even more terrified at the prospect of a Wendigo being added to the roster of passengers. Uh, it's nice to meet you. John scratched his head, looking up at the deer skull, still hesitant at the presence. The Wendigo gave no response. Instead, simply keeping quiet as he sat in the back of the helicopter next to me, John had told us that he had a location in mind of where to go, although he refused to give out these specific details for whatever reason. But even though this wasn't the last of the agency, they had taken quite a hit at their ability to function. For now, we would be free of their wrath in tyrannical ways. I turned my attention to the Wendigo. He sat idly, looking out the window at everything as we passed by below, seemingly entranced by his freedom similar to how I felt. They have a tracker on this helicopter, John exclaimed. So this time, I'll take your advice, Braun, and we'll trash this thing as soon as we get to the spot. I simply nodded in response, not taking my eyes off of my new ally. He seemed to have sensed that I was looking, and he turned, causing his antlers to slightly scrape the ceiling above him. I asked the quiet creature one simple question. Would you like a name?